This podcast is now available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more. Please leave a written review on whatever app you get this podcast from. Spoiler alert. When this podcast talks about Game of Thrones on HBO, it talks in the context of the most recently aired episode. And when it talks A Song of Ice and Fire books, it talks in the context of the most recently released book by George R. R. Martin. You've been warned. Dedicated to HBO's Game of Thrones and George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire book series, you're listening to Matt's audio blog, Game of Thrones. And now, here's your host, Matt Murdock. And welcome once again to Game of Thrones, Matt's audio blog. I'm Matt. Thanks for joining me. Today we're looking at Season 2, Episode 10, the season finale of Season 2, Valar Margulis, which was written by the showrunners David Benioff and Dan Weiss, directed by Alan Taylor, music by Ramin Javadi. And of course, that's one of my specialties in this particular podcast is talking about both the story side of things and the music side of things regarding this television show. And somewhere down the line, we'll be talking about the A Song of Ice and Fire books as well. But in order to prepare for an eventual season eight, we are rewatching the entire series from the very first episode. And if you want to hear any of those back episodes covering the music or covering the story, whichever portion of the podcast you like best, or maybe you like both, and that would be great for me if you did like both. But if you want to hear back episodes of the podcast, you can find them all at mattsaudioblog.com. That's M-A-T-T-S audioblog.com. There you can find contact links. You can also find social media links. You can find our YouTube, which we are now posting the podcasts in audio form on YouTube as well. Don't worry. You don't have to look at my face looking into a camera or anything like that. It's just the podcast logo and my voice, as usual. I have a face for radio, as they say. But I would also love to hear your feedback regarding these podcasts in one of two ways. First of all, if you have any thoughts about the podcast and you want to get them to me directly, you can send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com, M-A-T-T-S, audioblog at gmail.com, or you can tweet to Matt's G-O-T blog, M-A-T-T-S, G-O-T blog on the Twitter. And that's regarding anything concerning the show or regarding the podcast as well. You can also go to Matt's audioblog.com and find podcast app links. For instance, the Apple Podcast Store link, the Stitcher Store link, the Google Play Store link, the Acast Store link, and many others. And you can always leave me feedback on YouTube by commenting on the video if you wish, and I'll check those out before our next feedback podcast, which is actually coming up this week. It will be the Thursday cast for this week. We do two podcasts a week. You really only have today, and that's if you're getting it on the day that it's released. Today is July 9th, will be the day that this podcast is released, and you only have until midnight July 10th to get your feedback in. Not midnight July 11th, midnight July 10th. So get to work and get me your feedback regarding any of these season two episodes. We also have a couple of segments like three words where you try to describe each episode in three words. Feel free to submit that. Or the best coupling of the episode. We call that brothel mates of the episode. Feel free to submit that for any episodes. But get them in quick. Time is just about completely run out for this particular feedback podcast. We'll have another feedback podcast at the end of season three. So if you miss out this time, I understand. I won't hold it against you, but I hope to hear from you in the next feedback podcast. And I'll give you deadline dates for that once we get into season three. Anyway, as I was saying, if you want to tell me something specifically about the show that you like or dislike, the best way to do that is actually by leaving me a written review on whatever podcast app that you're using. If you're using Apple podcasts, then go to the Apple podcast store. Again, you can find these links at mattsaudioblog.com and leave a written review. That does two things. It, first of all, lets me know how you feel about the format of the show, what we're doing right or what we're doing wrong. Secondly, 
it helps me stay more noticeable when you give me feedback in that way, at least regarding the podcast, because the more written reviews I accumulate, the more noticeable I am among the Game of Thrones search engines for the different podcast apps. That's generally the standard by which podcast apps rank. And it's hard to find me in the Game of Thrones podcast search uh, a lot of times in some of these app stores. And that's because I haven't accumulated enough written reviews. Also, if you just want to hear your review, be it good or be it bad, being read on the feedback podcast, that's another way uh, to submit feedback for the feedback podcast is to leave a written review. I read those at, with each feedback podcast special, as well as we're going to be covering a little bit of news regarding season eight of Game of Thrones. Nothing spoilery. I totally promise you. Is there anything else to say about the podcast itself? I don't think so. Uh, other than this, on Mondays, we tend to do the story side of things first and the music side last. We're not going to break tradition here. We're going to do the story side of season two, episode 10, Valor Mogulis. All men must die, as we know is what it means in Valyrian now, uh, even though I pronounce it terribly. It was written by the showrunners David Benioff and Dan Weiss and directed by Alan Taylor. That story talk next. If you've been with me for a while, then this is all going to be stuff that you know and you're tired of hearing, but I'm in hopes that we're continually getting new listeners and I like to let them know what to expect, at least in terms of the format of this podcast. We start off talking about the story with things from the surface, how we feel about things, points that may not have lasting ramifications beyond the episode or may, but regardless, they do affect us as we're watching this episode. I then go to what I call my three big things, which is three key points in the episode that I try to relate in the whole of the series. Then we go to a section that's simply called questions, because every episode, there's probably a few unanswered questions that you can come up with. There was exceptions to that sometimes. Sometimes an episode is very well answered, given how many seasons that we've had now, especially some of these earlier episodes. But sometimes there are questions that have yet to be answered, and so we try to ask some of those questions. And finally, I have a little section called tidbits, which are other points which may have reached beyond the episode, but aren't maybe quite as important because that storyline is already wrapped up or what have you like that. So that's the format of this. And of course, we start on the surface first. And surface for me is generally more about the emotion of the episode than anything else. Uh, because I am not a person who solves puzzles anymore. I just don't do it. It's one of those things that if I try to solve a puzzle or make a prediction, I get mad at myself for letting myself place that expectation on an episode. And I know that some people can absolutely just make a straight out of left field prediction and then just let it go. I can't do that. Uh, it, this story is too important to me. And so in order to allow myself to feel each episode and enjoy it completely with a clean slate, I don't make predictions. Um, I do, however, always end up with a messy plate at the end of watching every single episode because there's always emotions in these episodes. And people get disappointed because there's not enough action. People get disappointed because... Nothing happened to this character in this particular episode or this scene was too short or that scene was too long. And man, you know, you can consume television that way if you want. I've never found an episode of this series to be boring. Ever. Not a single one. Because there's always some part of the story being told. And that's one of the things that's beautiful about this series to me. Anyway, off my soapbox now, let's talk about some of my surface things. And a lot of the emotion was sadness or sympathy. And I'm going to start with Theon and his talk with Lewin as that guy's blowing the horn and driving him crazy. Yeah, that's kind of funny. But when he says, do you know what it's like to be told how lucky you are to be someone's prisoner? And 
the whole idea when Lewin says the person that you're trying to be isn't the person that you are, or you've done things that's a person that is really who you're not. And Theon admits that he's done a lot, things that he would never have imagined himself doing. There's a lot of regret in there. And now, with the whole context of where Theon is in season seven and beyond, um, it's a little easier to reach back and and feel those lines a little more. It was very hard when season two was airing live to feel sorry for Theon, because even comments like this came across a little bit as evasive or as cocky in some way. And so when you got to the point where Theon was given this big speech about how they were going to fight and they were going to die and he thought he had the men with him and they were all yelling for him and everything. And then they go and knock him on the head. I mean, yeah, that's funny. But then it turns around and Maester Lewin gets stabbed by a spear by that cruddy Dagmar, who was really the cause of all of this. Let Theon think that Theon was in charge when really it was Dagmar making all of the mistakes. But Maester Lewin is the one who pays the ultimate price for that. And it was very sad. And just going straight to the end of that storyline for this season, seeing Winterfell burning and Lewin's goodbye to the boys and then having Osha end his life. I mean, I just, I'm not sure that I felt that much the first time I watched it, but Lewin, as silly as he was about the things like the children of the forest or dragons or giants or whatever, really did care for these boys. It's just a little line like, you know, I pulled you both from this world and I've been with you nearly every day since. And man, it's just heartbreaking to me. And I just sit and wonder how much easier it might have been for Bran if he'd had just had Lewin to be able to be with him, to go to the wall, to go beyond the wall. I don't know that Lewin could have survived the attack on the tree any more than Hodor did. I also don't know if Lewin would have approved of Bran becoming the Three-Eyed Raven in the first place. But I can at least think that getting to the wall would have been a little bit easier on him had Lewin been along to guide him in that way. And maybe by the time Jojen and Mira show up, he might have been convinced of Bran and Jojen's powers and uh, might have been more supportive after all. Who knows? That's a lot of what ifs. So we'll move on from there. But it was just really sad. All of that stuff. Feeling bad for Theon a little more than I did the first time around. And of course, the loss of Lewin seems... Um, so much more mon monumental now than maybe it did at the time. Something else on the surface for me emotionally and in an action and kick butt kind of way as well. And in a way that was very pro woman. And that was the scene with Brienne and Jamie. And the way that those men are laughing at her and everything and the look on her face. And Quinlan Christie has this great way of making you instantly feel sorry for her because she looks like a little nerd who's getting bullied by a bunch of school kids, right? But then you see what she can actually do and how the hanging of those women affected her. And, and when that guy said, yeah, we only gave two of them quick deaths, then, man, it just seems so fitting the way she dispensed justice to that same guy saying two quick deaths. <laughs> well, I gave you two quick deaths. Now, here, you take this long, slow death for yourself. That's a fist pump for me. I just, justice all the way. So you go from feeling bad for Brienne and the way that she's being treated so unequally, and then you just fist pump by the way that she is vastly superior to them in so many ways. And remember, these are stark soldiers right it's like wow how does stark soldiers get away with doing what they did any different in terms of their cruelty than lannister soldiers war is hell I, I mean i get that but it's just there there's a brutality to the mentality of these men that just made me fist pump seeing them get theirs this time around 
something else on the surface was Shea and Tyrion. <laughs> when she's undoing his bandage and she's basically just says, you're a mess. She doesn't look away. She doesn't try to make a joke. She just tells him like it is because she has gotten to where she really cares about Tyrion, I think, like he is. Uh, and even though he tries to send her away and blah, 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 or at least push her away, uh, she sticks to him until it gets to a point where, of course, he forcibly sends her away in season four. And that's when all bets are off. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, right? But the thing that really got me most about this was her saying that I am yours and you are mine. And the way that that made Tyrion cry. And Peter Dinklage just gave an excellent performance. It's got to be a pain in the butt to have all that like prosthetic makeup on or however they did the effect of his scarring tissue. But man, just moved me almost to tears on on that scene. Lots of lots of crying in this episode for me, or near crying. Eh, to whom I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to lie. Crying. So those are my things on the surface of this episode in terms of what hit me most emotionally. Um, things that just really resonated with me in terms of why we watch television in the first place, or at least why I watch television. I know people consume their television in different ways. Why I consume this episode in such a manner. But that brings me to my next thing, which is three big things. Three, three big things. And my first big thing, even though it was a pretty small scene, is still a huge deal. And that's that Arya wants to learn how to kill the people on her list. And the fascinating thing is that Jaqen Hagar, or whoever he actually is, because he says Jaqen is dead, is the Jock and Hagar face, just one that he wears because he likes it better and because we like that actor better, <laughs> more or less. Uh, but the point being is that Jock and Hagar knows that she has these names on our list and he tells her point blank, I can give you the skills with which to do so. And I remember towards the end of season six, I had just come back to watching the television show and everybody was so mad about the Arya storyline. So mad. It didn't make any sense. Jockin gave her exactly the skills that she needed to do this. The very first thing that he promises her right here, that's what she walks away f with. That's why the faceless men aren't coming to get her for leaving. The waif was the only one who wanted to come and get her. And you can call it lazy writing about how she survived or whatever. Listen, you got dragons in this show. So get over a few stab wounds. I mean, seriously. Dramatic flair is dramatic flair. That's my point. But the big thing is, Jockin delivers his promise to her. He absolutely delivers his promise to her. He tells her she has names on her list. He can give her the skills with which to eliminate those names on her list. And Arya wants those skills, but she's not quite willing to pay the price yet. She's not willing to pay the price until she knows or at least she thinks she knows, that every one of her family are dead. She essentially becomes no one in her own mind long before she ever gets to Bravos. Right here, she chooses to find her mom and her brother, and she mentions her sister. That's why I still feel like everything that happened in Season 7 with Arya and Sansa was a ruse, just to pull Littlefinger in. There may be a deleted scene out there that proves me wrong on that, but it's what I choose to believe. It's the way I make the storyline work. And I don't need to call it lazy writing because to me, the solution is right here on all of those storyline fronts. She does want to find her sister and she does merely want the skills with which to commit her own revenge. And Jockin promises her that, and then lets her go. If that's even the same person, or if maybe that's just someone else wearing Jock and Hagar's face, I don't know. But at any rate, it's not that she would become just an agent of the Faceless Men to take care of whoever the Faceless Men choose to take care of. He gives her the skills to make the judgment call 
with some of her other trials while she's in Bravos, and he gives her the skills to kill while she's in Bravos as well. There's one line that Jockin says which is funny, and it's the one that I think you can use to disqualify the Serio is Jockin Hagar theory that's been out there for years and years now. He says, to be a dancing master is a special thing, but to be a faceless man, something else entirely. I think that that probably disqualifies Jockin as being Serio, or Serio as being Jockin, or however you want to look at it. At any rate, this is huge. She gets the coin. The coin becomes as much a part of her mantra as her prayer does from here until the time she gets to Bravos. So that's big thing number one. Big thing number two, Rob. Now, you don't get the front end of this conversation, but I assume, and maybe this is wrong to do, but I assume that Rob came to Catelyn and said, I'm going to marry Talissa. And Catelyn's totally against this, and rightfully so. And her worst fears come realized when she says Walder Frey is a dangerous man to cross. And she goes on to tell the story to Rob about how her love with Ned was built up over time. And really, it did last longer than Rob's with Talissa because Rob and Talissa only have one season left. They weren't able to be together long enough to have children or to find the kind of love that Catelyn and Ned had. Another interesting thing about this, and I'm going to tie this in from another part of this episode, is in the Iron Throne Room, just earlier, there's this huge theatrical deal made out of Joffrey being betrothed to Sansa, but there's no such deal like that here with Rob. He's totally dismissed the idea of being betrothed to a fray, and he's just going to marry Talissa. So in that way, Joffrey might have been a little bit more blessed by the gods than Rob, which may be why he lasted a little longer, if you believe in the power of the gods in this particular story or not, I guess. But all of the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed as far as Joffrey went, whereas Rob just went off and made a rash decision and used the fact that Catelyn, he thought, had made a rash decision as an excuse to go on with it. And it's one of the most immature things that Rob does throughout the course of his life, in my opinion. Not that marrying Talissa for love was wrong. You can't help who you fall in love with. I get that. That's fine. But just like Catelyn says here, Walder Frey is a dangerous man to cross. Shouldn't some effort have been made to try and get Walder Frey to understand before marrying Talissa. Again, though, the place where that comes from is Rob is lost. Winterfell has been taken by Theon, and Bolton's son, bastard son, is going to go take care of it. He hasn't heard about Winterfell being destroyed yet, I don't suppose, by the time that he's getting married to Talissa. But at the same time, man, he's, he's worried about Winterfell. He's worried about this war with Joffrey. And he's stumbled upon this girl that he's fallen in love with. And so he totally goes with his heart and not his head. And yeah, that's that's a beautiful thing in some ways. But it's also a reckless thing in a lot of ways, just as Catelyn says. And it really bugged me that he threw that in Catelyn's face when actually... Catelyn is just so broken by all of this that she did the only thing she could to save her children. But it was with her head, as you saw. Brienne is perfectly capable of delivering Jamie, or so we think, until we get to season three. And then we see that Jamie and Brienne have to kind of work together to make that happen. From the time that that little ribbon gets tied around Talissa and Rob's hands, the red wedding is in the works. You can bet Walder Frey is going to hear about this wedding. 
you can bet that he's already planning some way to get revenge upon Rob. My third big thing is actually Melisandre with Stannis in this. And one of the things that really stuck out to me this time is Stannis talking about, you know, how he's been a soldier all his life and what have you. And and Melisandre says she's been fighting far longer than him. She says, I've been fighting far longer than you. And who would have thought that that would have been literally evident at the end of the season six, episode one episode, right? Where she takes the necklace off and lo and behold, wow, she has to have been fighting longer than Stannis because she looks like she's about seven times older than Stannis. Who knows how old Melisandre is? Big question. Melisandre also tells Stannis this, and this is something that on a rewatch I found very, very important. You will betray the men serving you. You will betray your family. You will betray everything you once held dear. And it seems, as you go through seasons three through five, that Stannis really covets his daughter Shireen. That she is way more important to him than she is to Selyse, his wife, her mother. There's also a lot of things in here that Melisandre says that's false. Things like, it'll all be worth it because you are the son of fire. Well, Stannis Baratheon is Azor Ahai not. But he does see something in the flames. And here, that seems like a pretty darn big deal that Stannis does. And he ends up telling, of course, Davos in Season 3 that what he saw was a battle in the snow, which... What we have to assume is the battle that he participated in at the wall. But the interesting thing and really the all encompassing thing that you find every time with the Lord of Light stories is that in their moment of greatest doubt, because Stannis is here, he's thinking about how he killed his brother. He wants to kill Melisandre for all that matter. He is in his most doubtful place and that's when he sees something in the flames just like melisandre is in her most doubtful place and that is when the ritual to bring john snow back works just like thoros of mir's story about how he was in his most doubtful place and was just trying to lay his hands on his friend beric dondarian and that's when Beric came back to life. Just like the hound is in his most doubtful place when he buries that father and daughter that he stole from in season four, he even sees something in the flame. He sees the location as to where they're going to find the white, more or less. I mean, that's just too many instances to be coincidence, right? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Lord of Light is the only one and true God or that the Lord of Light even exists. But it is very interesting that everything associated with this religion comes from a place where you are at your most humble and then something plausibly good happens out of that. So those are my three big things. Next, we move on to questions that I have that came out of this episode. Questions. questions. First couple questions are just a, a couple of kind of what if questions. And one of the things is Lewin, of course, counsels Theon just to go to the wall. And evidently there are tunnels in Winterfell to get out, just like there were tunnels in King's Landing to get out, which we've never seen those tunnels. I'm assuming they're connected to the crypts somehow. Maybe that's how... Osha and the boys got back in to the crypts when they first uh, returned from the, uh, the farmers. But Theon is told by Lewin to go to the wall and take the black. And my question is, what if Theon had tried to do that? What would the state of things be now? Winterfell would still most likely have been sacked and burned. 
I think that was just Ramsey's way of destroying the Stark family from within in his own quest for power. And it's questionable as to whether Roos gave that order or not. I don't remember any definitive thing saying one way or the other, but I can't imagine Roos disapproving. Anyway, if Theon gets up there and takes the black, well, John's not there, so he doesn't have to worry about John killing him anytime soon. But then he's not there to help Sansa out. And I don't see any of the other courses of events changing just because Theon gets away, right? I mean, the Red Wedding still happens. Ramsay still marries Sansa, except that Theon doesn't save Sansa from Ramsay's little side girl. And so Sansa's probably dead. So that wouldn't have been so good. On the plus side, if he'd have gotten away, he probably wouldn't have been as abused as he was by Ramsay. And so he'd still be together. But one also has to ask, is this even though it's a very, very cruel, inhumane lesson that Theon learns over the course of time and is still learning and is still trying to get over the abusiveness of Ramsay, something he probably never will completely get over, but he's still fighting, trying. Without this lesson, does he become the person who's willing to stand up for his sister at the end of season seven? Here's another what if. What if Tyrion had left with Shay and went to Pintos or Essos or wherever it is that she wanted him to go? Is it possible that Tyrion still might have ended up in Danny's service? Or is it less likely? You have to consider that it's really what happens in season four and concerning his prosecution about Joffrey's murder that makes him hate his family so much that he probably does want to go to war with them. In season one, he says, you know, I love my family. He's actually more than willing to stick up for them. He finds out here in this episode, of course, that somebody in his family wants him dead. Now, Varys has the wrong person, but he starts to develop these suspicions about his family uh, from this point forward. However, the real damage isn't done until, say, season four. And so Shay probably doesn't end up dead. So he doesn't have to feel guilty about that. And since he doesn't hate his family as much, would he be willing to serve Danny? Even if Varys, for some reason, had fled to Essos and found Tyrion later on and said, hey, look, we got to go back this Danny chick, would Tyrion have gone? I know. It's just a lot of what ifs, a lot of hypotheticals that will never get an answer or anything like that. But if you have a feeling about that, feel free to email me, mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. That's M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com or Matt's G-O-T blog on the Twitter. Here's a big one to unpack, and it's a storyline we haven't talked about yet. Daenerys herself and her little trip in the House of the Undying. The big question you have to ask is, what were those visions? I mean, were they literally kind of visions of the future to be interpreted the same way that Bran saw the ocean coming over the walls of Winterfell? Are these somewhat metaphoric visions of the future? For instance, with the Iron Throne vision, it's winter and the throne is vacant. Now, with Cersei sitting the throne, you might consider the throne being vacant already. You might not, but you definitely know that winter is coming. And I'm not saying that this is an actual event. I'm saying this is metaphoric. The Red Keep has been torn apart. And the snow is rather heavy where it's just started in the last that we saw at the end of Season 7. So it would still be perhaps in the future. But maybe that is a metaphor in itself. Is the Iron Throne no longer needed? Has the Red Keep been destroyed because there is no king or queen or anything to sit there anymore? In the same respect, she then goes north of the wall where she is reunited with Khal Drogo. And one has to assume her son, which she was going to name what? Rago? Is that what she was going to name him? Um, When she sees them, does that offer any kind of metaphor? 
will she join them in death north of the wall at some point. Now that the White Walkers have already come through the wall, it doesn't seem as likely as the interpretation, unless, you know, somehow in the course of battling them back, they're north of the wall again. Does it have to be that literal? One of the things that I noticed this time around was how as soon as Danny decided that she couldn't be there with Drogo and Rego, that they suddenly became unanimated. It was almost like they were animatronics that uh, were shut down as soon as she rejected them. It was like Drogo just kind of went to motionless, expressionless, uh, like he was just some kind of robot that had been shut down. And that makes me ask, if you don't believe that these are actually visions to be interpreted, then do you believe that they were just tricks to act as baubles to distract Danny? And you can make a case against that by saying, well, Pia Pri tells her just as soon as she gets into the room with the dragons that their magic is strongest in the presence of the dragons and that the dragons are strongest in the presence of her. What's the proximity factor there? Does she have to be right next to them? Obviously, now that she got in there, they chained her up there and thought, well, that's good. Of course, they didn't realize that she can't be hurt by fire. Or he. It's a confusing thing to me, too. How, how many Pyat Prees are there, actually? If it was just a parlor trick, as Zoro Zohan Doxos had said earlier in the season, why does he need to be but one person there? Well, I guess to attach chains on her. But unpack that one for me. Give me your interpretation of what Danny sees at the House of the Undying. I would love to hear from you regarding that. And if you can't make it by July 10th, 2018, which is, by the time you hear this recording, tomorrow, that's your deadline. Uh, if you can't make it by that time, well, send it to me anyway. We'll include it in the Season 3 feedback podcast, which will come out after we complete Season 3 stuff. Here's another question. How does anyone survive the White Walker attack on the Fist of the First Men? Look at all of the numbers there at the end. I mean, they look overwhelming, considering no more men were at the Fist of the First Men. Also, if you're one of those mutineers, once you get to Craster's, why the heck are you staying north of the Wall when you know that the White Walkers are out there? I mean, maybe they figure that they're safe as long as they continue to offer the boys? What if they run into a stretch where they don't have any boys with all of these wives? I guess they figure that their their odds are pretty good. I don't know. That would be the only reason I could figure why they would think that they could stay. And the shot of Sam seeing the White Walkers coming and all of that foggy cold coming at him before you actually see the White Walkers, very reminiscent of the scene in Hardhome where you saw just kind of like the snow just coming towards the walls. But if the White Walkers do bring the weather, why didn't we see any of that in the scene in the pilot when the Rangers first discovered that the White Walkers were there? Maybe you need more than one uh, because I don't think the weather was as affected by the one with Sam and Gilly. But I'll have to check that out when I get to that episode uh, coming up in the near future. So those are some questions to roll around in your head. And again, feel free to contact me. Matt's audio blog at gmail.com. M-A-T-T-S audio blog at gmail.com. Or Matt's G-O-T blog on Twitter. M-A-T-T-S G-O-T blog on Twitter. We're up to the small stuff now. And none of it's really small. I love this episode. I think it's great. Uh, but we're up to tidbits. 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 So tidbits are just odds and ends that we have that might still have a little bit of a lasting ramification on the story. And as I mentioned before, Varys had some bad info on Mandon Moore. Maybe Cersei relayed the order to Mandon Moore. But we find out later on or at least Tyrion deduces, that it was Joffrey. And of course, we know that Tyrion's pretty smart about the game. And so we assume that his conclusion is correct. Also, 
Varys hires Roz. And this whole episode doesn't put Varys in the best of light. We do also know that he fears anybody wielding magic. And the whole idea of what that religion is, is explained further in Season 3. And, of course, we see how he has to deal with another Red Priestess directly in Season 6. And then Melisandre herself in Season 7. Where all of that's going for Varys, uh, there's no telling. Move on to Jamie, who, in an effort to get a rise out of Brienne, because if he feels like he could fight her, maybe he can escape. He starts talking about how ugly Brienne is and how there surely was a boy who wanted the challenge of being with such a big woman. And then he speaks of rape to try and get under her skin even more. It doesn't work, of course. But the interesting thing is, is that even though he's doing all of this right now in this moment, when it comes down to it, where Brienne is facing actual rape, he does try to do his best to protect her. In fact, he keeps her from being raped and he ends up losing his main identity as a result to Locke. He ends up losing his hand because he tried to protect her. Circling back around to post-battle with Shay, <laughs> I love this line where she said, leading men in battle, you're terrible at this, basically. Uh, not only was it funny, but it seems to be true. Tyrion doesn't really have the best military mind, so to speak, or at least if you look at season seven, in fact, we praise Tyrion here because he did stave off Stannis long enough to allow Tywin to come in. But really, Tyrion still lost this battle. It was Tywin who did win it. And that's rubbed in his face by Pycelle, who, by the way, is very, very unlike the doddering old man that we normally see. He's more like the guy who was doing squats when we saw him at the end of season one. It's like the end of the season appearance of Pycelle is always the guy who is a lot more alert and a lot more sharp than he lets on to everybody else. And then you have the John storyline. And I, I gotta say, man, that in this episode, the John storyline seems the most disappointing to me. I never felt like what Corrin's idea on how to get John on the inside was explained well enough or even executed well enough. This fight seemed awkward. It seemed way out of character. Um, we knew that Corrin was setting it up. And of course, on a rewatch, you know what's going to happen. But the fact that Corrin just stood there and allowed John to stab him it was just a little weird. It didn't seem like that that would have been very convincing to the Lord of Bones or to even Egret at all. I'd been going, well, why did he do that? And you have to wonder, you know, was John so much in the know that he knew to run his sword through corn? Because it seems like that would go against every instinct John has. And that's an interesting point that John was able to do that. But I just, Never felt satisfied by what happened with Corrin Halfhand, really throughout the whole entire season. Finally, and this one is fairly big, it almost made one of my three big things, but Littlefinger is starting to, let's call it, recruit Sansa. I mean, he's kind of been in her ear all along. If you remember back in season one, when he was telling her the story of the hound and the mountain when they were at the hand tourney. All of this stuff is happening. And he says that he sees so much of Catelyn at a young age in Sansa. And it's all just so creepy. And it continues to be creepy all the way up through the point where he ends up getting killed by Sansa and Arya. He has this weird perverse idea that if he can't have Catelyn, then at least maybe he can have Sansa. 
And that just seems so bizarre to me and sick in a lot of ways. The one thing that he does do in this episode is that he promises to help her get home, right? And I guess you can say that he did keep that promise. He got her out of King's Landing, and then he did get her back to Winterfell. Not in the way that we would have liked, you know, as Ramsay's wife, which ended up being a disaster, but he did end up keeping his promise in a way. And now, of course, she is the Lady of Winterfell. I'm not exactly sure what all that entails. John is king in the north, but maybe Sansa is still in control of Winterfell. I would like to see that more defined because John's been gone a lot, obviously, in season seven. Sansa's had to run things, I'm assuming. She's also had to defend John in some ways. And what it's all going to mean when, of course, John's true heritage is found out. Will they declare Sansa queen in the north if John is found out to be a Targaryen? Or will they keep John as the king in the north anyway? And I suppose that that's all that I have for this particular episode. We do have two more little segments before we get into my musical analysis for this episode three words where we describe the episode in three words and brothel mates of the episode which is basically the best coupling of the episode three words is next three words describing the episode in three words so three words describing the episode in three words and my three words for this particular episode are promises eventually kept which you may be going well what's going on with that well, when you look at it, Littlefinger was promised Heron Hall earlier in the season. He eventually gets it. He promises Sansa that he will take her to Winterfell. She eventually gets to Winterfell. Again, not necessarily in the same way that she wants to get to Winterfell, but she does get there. Marjorie eventually does become the queen. And Arya does eventually get the skills that she needs to take her revenge on people. So, lots of promises are eventually kept. Some in this episode, some made this episode. But those are my three words. What would your three words be? Feel free to send an email to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com or to tweet Matt's G-O-T blog on Twitter. I know it'll be tough to get them in by our next feedback podcast because that deadline is essentially midnight tomorrow, which means actually midnight tonight. But if you can't make it this time around, then please feel free to continue to submit just as soon as you feel able. And eventually there'll be a feedback podcast that I can get your feedback in because I will leave no feedback behind. <laughs> we still have this section coming up. The brothel mates of the episode. It's the best coupling of the episode. That's next. Brothel mates of the episode. The best coupling of the episode. Brothel mates of the episode is the best coupling of the episode. You don't necessarily have to pick two people. You can pick a person and a concept, or you can pick a person and an object, or anything in that regard. But I'm going two people this time around, and I'm actually going literally brothel mates because that was the way that they met. I'm going Tyrion and Shay because this is the pledge that actually made me root for the two of them a little bit. Shay in the television show is a lot more endearing, let's just say, than Shay in the books. And I really enjoyed this couple as compared to that coupling in the books. There isn't near as much investment in each other in the books as there is in the television show. And that makes the television show, in this case, better. And it makes the betrayal that Shay does on Tyrion more impactful to me later on down the line in season four because you are more invested in the Shay and Tyrion relationship. What would your brothel mates of the episode be? What would your best coupling be? Maybe you go to the other side. You go to Rob and Talisa because they are getting married or maybe... You go to Catelyn and 
captivity because uh, Rob is pretty much done with his mom. Anything like that would work. Submit yours. Send the email to Matt's audio blog. That's M-A-T-T-S audio blog at gmail.com. Or you can tweet Matt's G-O-T blog on Twitter. M-A-T-T-S G-O-T blog on Twitter. So the time has come to finally talk about the music of the episode. This time around, we're looking at a theme that we've actually visited before, but we're going to take a nice, long, hard look at this particular treatment because it is somewhat unique, though it is repeated in Season 7 to a certain degree. That's next. An analysis of the music in HBO's Game of Thrones. So that is from the final scene of season two, where Sam witnesses the White Walkers starting to assault the Fist of the First Men with its army of whites, and it's quite an overwhelming army. There's something that's really interesting here, and actually Ramin repeats this in season seven as the White Walkers are assaulting the wall, but we'll get to that in a second. He wanted to represent the White Walker theme in a way, but he disguises it in many ways simply by using what we call intervals. That's the distance between notes to dictate how he was going to perform the main theme, which he always does at the end of each season. There's some variation of the main theme being played as the final scene comes on. But just so you know what I'm talking about in terms of the intervals, listen to the chords when you normally hear what is the White Walker theme was established in the very first episode of Game of Thrones when Will and the guys were out looking for the wildlings and they ended up finding a White Walker and a white instead. This is what I'm talking about here. And what you have here is the specific interval, again, distance between two notes of the first two chords of the theme is what Ramin plays off of. And so we're used to, of course, hearing the thing like dun, 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 but he has to find the notes in between those two notes so that he has the different notes going on. So what he does is he comes up with this. which is, of course, supposed to remind you of this. Now, here's the trick. You see, normally between those first two notes, those intervals that I played, usually there's only one note in between that when you're building scales from the lowest note to the highest note. But instead, he needs two in order to make that rhythm that I just played and to make that kind of sequence that I just played. So he has to borrow from a very, very exotic sounding scale. It is the seventh mode of the melodic minor ascending scale. You don't need to remember that. Trust me, I'm not going to test you on this or anything. It's called Super Locrian Mode. You don't need to remember that either. But by playing a certain scale from different what we call scale degrees, meaning different members of the scale, for instance, like the root of a scale has the completion kind of feeling. Playing from the 7 to the 7 is what creates the Super Locrian Mode. So the actual scale from which this is derived, the way Ramin plays the melody in this scene, 
is actually this. He uses the same notes of the scale, but creates a whole different feeling because he's starting in a different place and ending in a different place. The seventh degree scale step, which creates the super Locrian mode. This. Both of those scales have the exact same notes. It's just where you start and where you end that makes him sound weird. And if that last scale, if you look at it, the two notes that we needed in order to create that interval in between the two notes that we started that interval with are existent. And that's exactly what Ramin Javadi uses. He also can use this to play the main melody motif of Game of Thrones as well, not just that accompanying motive that we talk about. And again, a motive is a small part of a theme. It's not the whole theme in itself. It's like taking a puzzle and breaking down the pieces in a lot of ways. But you can use the melodic element also by doing this with the rhythm. It really becomes a matter of what rhythm you're playing. And that, of course, is supposed to remind you of this. So to kind of get a feel for the difference between what happens here in Season 2 and what happens in Season 7, let's listen to the Season 7 scene. So you feel more like the main theme is being played here, whereas in the prior one, while some of the main theme illusion was there, it felt much more like just the motive of the harmonic line that goes along. And that's naturally because the White Walkers are now not just something trapped north of the wall, not something contained, but it's the biggest Game of Thrones ever. And so that makes that more important. Also note, the timbral differences, meaning the sounds that are used, the instrumentation used. If you go back to my very first podcast on this feed, the placeholder podcast, I examined the main theme and I talked about how vocal stuff is sometimes used more for SOC kind of things. Now, you might say, but the White Walkers are in Westeros. They've always been in Westeros. What's going on with that? Well, what is the difference? The Night King has a dragon. Not only that, but he has one of Danny's dragons. And that dragon was born in Essos. And so, using the voice becomes even better for the Essos kind of timbre. That same template that he's been using all along. And granted, there are always exceptions. There are always little bends in the rules. But for the most part, the voice and Essos being tied together has been fairly true all throughout. So I love that he decided to use the voice. Plus, he just loves to use vocal things in the finales anyway, whenever he can. But note, he didn't hear in season two. He kept everything pretty much in the vein of Westeros because this was happening north of the Wall. And we didn't make any kind of Essos connection with the Night King, who wasn't even seemingly present during this scene. But those are just some things to think about in regarding how 
just because the rhythm is there can remind you of the melodic that you heard before and so that you don't really necessarily need the same notes but sometimes you need to make sure there's the same number of notes in between and that's why these exotic scales not only sound really scary or really weird but they also help to fulfill a functional need and with that I'm going to leave you with actually the end credits for season two, which continued the theme that we heard at the very beginning of this segment. However, just to make sure that you knew where he got these strange intervals from, he threw in those usual White Walker chords over the top of everything so that you knew that this theme was derived from the White Walker theme and applied to the main theme. And I'll be back with some closing thoughts here in a second. Thanks for listening. Two seasons down, five to go. I think we're going to definitely get done doing two episodes a week before Game of Thrones even returns for season eight. But we'll have more stuff in between our finishing our rewatch and getting into season eight itself, I'm sure. In the meantime, this is like your last day for feedback for season two's feedback podcast. We're going to have more feedback podcasts. We'll have one at the end of season three. So don't fret if you have any season two thoughts. This isn't your absolute deadline to send them in. It's just your last time to get them in before the next feedback podcast. You have until midnight tonight if you're getting this on the Monday. If you're getting it on a Tuesday or a Wednesday afterwards, well, you're too late. But we will have the feedback podcast later this week, and we will then continue on into Season 3, Season 4, Season 5, and such. Please remember that any musicians or anything that I've listed in the show notes need your love just as much as I do. I need your love by sending me written reviews on whatever podcast app that you use. They need your love by listening to their music or consuming their music or just noting that they were the person who was part of this podcast. That's really all you have to do. You can contact me with anything that you have regarding this podcast or regarding the episodes of Game of Thrones by sending emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com or you can submit a tweet to Matt's GOT blog on Twitter. Again, all of that is M-A-T-T-S. Or if you need links for anything, including like our YouTube or any of the podcast apps, you can always go to M-A-T-T-S audioblog.com. See you next time.